Omni African Collective, building community, pending revolution. Good afternoon. This is Author's Perspective. This is Omni African TV, Omni African Collective. We've we've been gone for a while, but we have a tremendous surprise for you all. We are here with Dr. Earl Ofari Hutchinson, and we will be covering his work, The Myth of Black Capitalism. And it is just truly an honor. I'm Christopher Marshall, Director of Research, co-founder of the Omni African Collective. And it is an honor to be back with you all. And well, let's just get into it because you know this. Is, first off, you know, this is I mean, this is an antique. This is this is a this is a gem. This is definitely a gem. And it's just been such a valuable book. And I guess just for, for starters, just to let you know, um, the way that I guess our generation, but me in particular, is as well as our study group, the way we found out about your book, it was actually on the book list of George Jackson. And I, well, it was it was oh, on oh. the book. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. So I, I guess after you know, he was assassinated. Um, there was a, I think about a hundred book book list. Your book was number eight. You know, I don't think it was, you know, chronological, but you know, uh, you know, as, and it, it was funny, it was during Black August. So a bunch of us were able, you know, at time when it was, you know, more accessible, we were all able, you know, to get your book. Just going through it, you know, something from like a different universe because, you know, I mean, of course, in the Black community where everything is financial literacy and, you know, don't ask for handouts and always you know, do for self and, and just all the economic, uh, just mythology. It, it was just such a breath of fresh air to get concrete, realistic, practical, just economic analysis. And it's just such an honor. So just starting off, um, who is Earl O'Farr? Who is Earl O'Farr Hutchinson? <laughs> okay, uh, Christopher. Well, first of all, thanks for having me on the show. Um, I appreciate that. Um, Oh, God. You know, there are a lot of different hats, but I think for our purposes, I always say author and political analyst. Uh, the Myth of Black Capitalism, by the way, that was written when um, last year, 51st year after, <laughs> since the, the Myth of Black Capitalism was written. It was my first book. Uh, I was in college when I wrote it at California State University at Los Angeles, and um, that was in 1970. You know, long before Christopher Marshall was even thought of, <laughs> not even born, most people probably yeah. the show. You know, you know, the whole gener two gen no, not one, two generations removed. Um that saying I've written 25 books. Um, and also a number of books now, of course, with the new technology, a number of ebooks. So print books, ebooks, a total probably about 30. The other uh, hat I wear, I'm the president of the Law Kansas Policy Roundtable. And we're a community, a civil rights, community uh, activist, education organization. You know, we're on the point with a lot of different issues, not only in Los Angeles, but, uh, you know, nationally. But politics is my thing. Uh, political analyst uh, analysis and economic analysis has always been my strength. So in addition to writing, in addition to other uh, community work and activism and so and organizing, uh, also to a lot of media stuff I've done, um, looking at the political process and so forth. So basically, uh, you know, I wear different hats, but we come back to the thing that they always been my hallmark and trademark. I'm a writer. Yeah, I mean, that, it's so impressive, you know, just not even only your your great catalog of, you know, all these publications. I was also a very big fan of, you know, your daughter's work as well, Sakivu. Yes, yeah. I was so impressed because I'm also a Black atheist. So to read her work and just kind of, you know, also tie it in, it's so wonderful when we see families of scholars as well. And I saw that it was interesting how all the different hats that you wear kind of converged even just the last couple of days with the situation that happened. Is it La Brea? And then also what happened, you know, with Brittany Griner as well. And just hearing that you also publish, you know, a book on her whole situation, which is 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 brilliant which is you know pretty awesome yeah actually uh you're right that was one of the ebooks that i did uh, it wasn't just an ebook with technology christopher you can do both you can do an ebook okay. and you can do a print book through amazon so actually i did both uh small print uh hardcover well paperback 
and then the ebook. Yeah, I became fascinated with the case. Um, to be honest with you, in the beginning, this when she was first arrested back in February, mm -hmm. I didn't pay much attention. I'm not into women's basketball. I'm an NFL guy. I'm an NFL okay. junkie. Once you get into <laughs> baseball, football, I don't know. But anyway, um, so I didn't pay much attention, didn't know much about her. But then as I learned more about her, it, it's not, not just because of the arrest and the criminal quote unquote aspect of it, but I looked at it and I said, God, you got the complete package here. Uh, you got sports exploitation, especially with women and professional mm -hmm. sports, how they're not paid anything compared to men. Uh, you have got uh, gender issues. You've got same sex issues since she's a lesbian. You got mm -hmm. racial issues. And on top of everything, you put international relations issues, Russia and the US, the continuing tensions that are there, and the war in the Ukraine. So all of these things came together. And I said, you know, this, this is a complete package here. You're right. Let, again, address this um, with a book. A book there. By the way, I tell you, I didn't realize the. Uh, tremendous interest in the case the book on grind a small one it didn't take that long um it went faster than any other either i've ever done on amazon to number one not only in one category but multiple categories so you know at the end of the day i wish her well uh, i think she will be released i don't know about the prisoner swap but you know i think there are a lot of lessons to be learned about sports women uh, race, gender, all of that. So, you know, Christopher, these are the kinds of issues, you know, that I'm, that I'm always very attentive to. Yeah. It's just so wonderful to be able to talk to you because so often, you know, when we read past works where a lot of our authors have passed on. So it's great to be able to ask you, you know, not only about your present work, but as, but as well as your uh, past work. And I, I just think it's, it's great that we have your expertise and your experience and, and your knowledge to be able to have a perspective on what's happening to Griner, I mean, and even, you know, linking it in with other athletes as, as well in terms of people who've, you know, been persecuted, you know, throughout the years. And and just kind of hopping back into the uh, myth of Black capitalism, I, I always was interested, what inspired you to write the myth of Black capitalism? Well, um, we're talking about, take you and your viewers back in time. We're talking about 1970, 71. Now, mm -hmm. you got to remember, we're coming out of the 60s now. And the 60s, as we well know, particularly the late 60s, 67, 60, 69, and in the 70, you're talking about the, the Black Panther Party, you're talking about Black nationalism, you're talking about Black militancy, Black radicalism, uh, you're talking about a lot of things in that period. Um, mm -hmm. Remember now, we're getting past Dr. King and civil rights, we're now getting into a whole other phase of the Black struggle. The militancy, the uh, phase. So, uh, as a college student, um, we had uh, on my campus, California State University, we had the second Black Student Union. Back then, the whole thing wow. was forming Black student unions on campuses. San Francisco State was the first. Uh, California State University, where I was, was the second. So we we had a radical tradition. So I came. So I'm grounded in that. But even more clearly grounded in uh, Marxist ideas ah. the, that that at that time was starting to gain a lot of credence. And we had uh, study groups um, reading some of the classics from Marx, uh, Engels, Lenin, Mao, um, and of course, Kwame Nkrumah, uh, the African Marxists. So all of these things, you know, they were having an influence. Now, Christopher, what happened? Richard Nixon comes along. President mm -hmm. Nixon. And uh, he says, we're going to, and it was pretty clever what he tried to do. We're going to co-opt black militancy. And the way he did that is black capitalism, black <laughs> capitalism. We're going to create and we're going to build a black capitalist class, small business people, um, entrepreneurs, trades people, crafts people, uh, use them capitalism works blacks now can be in fact uh major players in the capitalist game so all of these things coming together the radical tradition things i was involved with the readings 
Nixon now putting black capitalism on the table. And by the way, Christopher, when he did that, that really set off a chain. There was a huge debate. I mean, I can't emphasize enough, huge debate uh, within the African-American communities and especially the intellectual communities and the business community about black capitalism. What does it mean? Can it happen? Is there anything to that? Can that really be a reality? One other thing. Uh, the NAACP, they were beginning to change in uh, the urban league, but especially the NAACP, they were beginning now to pick up on that. Well, hey, maybe the best way is now not the marches, not the protests, the demonstration, but let's build up some black millionaires. Let's build up some big black capitalism and a black oh, capitalism. Man. Now, money, money will solve the problem. That is the path to liberation. Not marching, not protests, not political action, but hey, baby, dollars, 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 you know, becoming wealthy, becoming a player in the capitalist game. Somehow uh, in the minds of many, and by the way, a lot of people bought into that saying, hey, you know what? They're right. Um, so I felt I had to debunk that. <laughs> I said I had to debunk that by not only looking at the present, but also going back in time and putting a history to it. Black capitalism, um, Chris, we have to realize, it's not new. Nixon coined it as a, as a buzz uh, concept. But, you know, we've always, going back almost to the beginning, um, either in slavery, you always had a free Black population, not big, <laughs> but you always had free Blacks. And you always had, even in the era of the 1850s, the 1860s, you all said, even during slavery, you had some blacks that were business people and trades people. So that's not that's not a new concept. You know, capital, capitalism, business, trading, building assets. And then over time, we've always had a black business class. You know, in the South, even during the height of segregation for 60, 70 years, you had very you had very successful uh, black insurance companies. They call them then Negro insurance companies, Negro mm -hmm. Negro owned banks, Negro owned uh, uh, retail stores. So that's not there's nothing new about that. What mm -hmm. was new about it, Nixon and the rest put black on it. <laughs> when they put black on it, it made it seem like it was something something totally different, <laughs> revolutionary. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, it's it's just so interesting, you know, because we were reading Black Power, Politics, Liberation, and, and, I, and I saw that you quoted that book quite often, uh, along with H. Rap Brown, because he was one of your, you know, beginning quote. And then we also read Malcolm X, By Any Means Necessary, and Final Speeches. And your book, like, was able to kind of bring a lot of concepts together and, and really put legs under, you know, a lot of different, it, it put legs up under, you know, different ideas from like an H.R. Brown, from a Charles Hamilton, from a Kwame Ture, who was Stokely Carmichael at the time. And it, it really illustrated what was going on because I think, you know, one of the things that really was very controversial was, of course, H.R. Brown's position of, you know, the system and how, he, how his analysis in terms of you can't build where something exists, as well as the commentary of Malcolm X, even in Aubrey Barnett, when they were criticizing the nation, you know, and just kind of bringing together the analysis of how capitalism was just, you know, very exploitative and, and just, you know, looking at your beginning quotes, it started to kind of really illustrate what was going on because for so long we're peddled this black self-help mythology that simply doesn't exist. And I think one thing that really was kind of driven home was not only when I read your book for a second time, but was, was when I began to study what was happening with the black elite as well as what was happening with a lot of churches as well as you know the nation and seeing that your analysis went even further than the initial group of people you were talking about it kind of it's it's everything it's everything that you said on steroids now so now instead of having a lot of the black competent leaders that were around at your time now we we're getting like some of the worst demagogues and scammers that are running our political movements so i think your work is more relevant now than ever, in my opinion, you know, because I mean, 
right now to even have an analysis like yours is like looked at as like obscene. But when you look at what's actually happening versus the propaganda, it's it's just unbelievable because like everything that you're saying, I can I can just I can have 10 examples for every analysis you have of, of a particular group, of a particular institution. And it's just it's really a timeless work, you know, to say the least. You know, um, Christopher, well, a couple of things. Um, let's go from ni- the 1970 to today. Let's let's connect some dots based on what you're saying. Um, what's different now? Uh, then 50, a little bit over 50 years ago, when you had the big emphasis on the so many blacks at the top, the black upper class, the black elite, we use the term black elite then, um, talking about building up wealth. What do we hear today? We hear from a lot of people in the black community, you know, forget civil rights, forget political action, create wealth. That's all we hear. Mm-hmm. Well, as if somehow magic. Basically, uh, wealth is just <laughs> create all this, this nirvana. Uh, wealth is going to cure homelessness, disproportionate, as we well know, African American, uh, African American. Wealth somehow is going to uh, end mass incarceration, as we well know, a disproportionate number African Americans. Wealth somehow, just getting money and wealth, is somehow going to um build up a community where you have literally uh the majority in underserved communities that are poor and somehow wealth is going to change rotten failing public education system you know that has done a tremendous disservice you know to young african americans uh at all levels so all of these these are structural things so it's it, it's still a myth it was then to think that just cre- getting tens of millions of dollars in your pocket or your business is somehow going to alleviate all the structural problems. That's number one. The second thing that hasn't changed, capitalism is still, and in fact, if anything, Christopher, is even worse today. Now yeah. we got the 1%. By that, I mean, right, the wealth is concentrated even more so than in 1970 is is concentrated at among fewer and fewer in major super corporations and major banks and wall street remember in 1970 you still despite everything even though obviously the economy wasn't what it was what it wasn't then what it is now you still have had more of a leveling among blacks in terms of their e-cabbers you know you had to follow that we're not denying that you didn't have this great wealth gap within our community and other communities in 1970. Well, Christopher, as you well know, I'm here to tell you today, the gap founding, not only within African-American communities, but outside the community and in, in the general community, capitalism is still has not changed. It still comes down to one thing, a small percentage of owner at the top, the super rich, that control all of the financial, uh, industrial, commercial, and retail decisions at top to bottom, the whole food, economic food chain, top to bottom, they still control. Now, that's not to say, I, I think we have to say one thing, Christopher, in all fairness. Mm-hmm. Right. That's not to say and discourage African Americans from trying to, you know, businesses, be entrepreneurs. There's even young people. I don't have a problem with that. Mm-hmm. Um, to essentially build up, if you can, using all the mechanisms, building up a business for the community, if, if your head is screwed on right, in, mm-hmm. in the sense of not just get wealthy and making money, but, you know, trying to get back and produce something productive in the community. No problem with that. And I didn't attack that, by the way, in the myth of black capitalism either. My critique mm-hmm. was the structural nature and the illusion that you can free yourself through a capitalist system and using the means of capitalism. That was my critique. It, it was not to say discourage those that want to be, you know, want to start businesses, uh, have a particular skill and an expertise, and essentially very economically productive. I have no problem with that. And, and I encourage that. 
Just don't have any illusions, though. Just continuing off, I mean, just what you said, man, I thought, because I guess I'm going to just jump around because I had so many questions, but just going off of, you know, what you said, even say starting at the end, right? You you said basically how, how we have to organize economically is... You said businesses cannot be run individually or corporately for the benefit of a few of a few, as is now the case. They must instead be community financed and collectively controlled and operated. And then you also said the production, distribution, and marketing of goods, and not to mention the vital decision making processes, must be expanded and must include a total range of black participation. This participation must be both uh, democratic and direct. So kind of going to what you said, it it just kind of gave, I mean, that right there. Are, are the solutions that we need right now because too often, you know, we're not giving a, like we're not giving a structural analysis. Everything is all is always like a magic pill, but what you said right there is an organizational solution to where everybody's involved, everybody has a say, and just based on like my own research, it runs parallel not only to African like communalism, but the African bureaucracy that existed within indigenous institutions. So when, when we get into, you know, our or like African centered crowd, it's a solution that we can slide right in and it's not all over the place. It's it, it works perfectly. So now there's no excuse for something to be exploitative when we have so much history. And, and I know, as a matter of fact, since the region that you went to school, I mean, there's so, so many of our great scholars are out there, including yourself, but you know, with Theophile of Banga and Wade Nobles, and you know, I, I know that you know, those solutions run perfectly with what already exists, you know, in African culture as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I think um, uh, section in the book talking about, and I think that's what you're referring to, a section in there talking about communalism yeah. and uh, cooperative economics. Mm -hmm. uh, that was big then. Um, mm -hmm. You had Dr. Ron Amalana Karinga. Uh, mm -hmm. You had another, the, a lot of the nationalists in. That's what they were talking about. Communism, mm -hmm. Using the old African model. Um, mm -hmm. coming together, pooling resources, sharing resources, building on that, not just simply making money for individuals. Mm -hmm. See, that's the key, not just trying to make an individual rich, but, but how can you use wealth if you can create creative, how can you use that basically to do a lot of things, um, build schools, expand schools, uh, within the community, private functioning black oriented schools secondly housing how can you do that in other words uh, and, and a lot of structural things using the money and the funding from a communal pooling pooling together resources to actually build and support other uh, structures in the community in other words community development in the right that's what we were we weren't using that term then because it didn't exist that term now that's the buzzword uh, now. how to develop yeah. and so that's a, that's and that's what I'm referring to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I, I just thought it was also so brilliant how you were able to mirror the situation, not only with what you call domestic colonialism, but I guess colonialism and neocolonialism in Africa. Because, you know, we're always under the impression that what exists in America is this unique phenomenon. But when you look at what's happening in Africa, whether it's in 1970 or even now, a lot hasn't changed. I mean, like you said, a lot has gotten worse in terms of, you know, the wealth gap. And, and, and even now, the whole racial wealth gap thing has become another form of a propaganda where a lot of our people are told that, you know, reparations will um, close that racial wealth gap. And you also even spoke to that. And because you said that, you know, it's unreasonable to think that the government will give you money and, and it won't have a lot of stipulations onto it. I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but um, yeah, I mean, because a lot of people think we'll get billions or trillions of dollars with no strings attached. <laughs> let me ask you this, Christopher, and let me ask the yeah. uh, listeners and the viewers this. When has this government ever given African-Americans anything, anything with string attached, <laughs> a whole rats to it? Um, no, Man. I think, again, we're talking about delusions and illusions. First of all, let's talk about reparations for a second. We, um, you've had community activists, you've had black love all the way back into the 60s and even before that, that have been talking about reparations for slavery. That's what we're talking about uh, and, and putting figures on it. 
by about tens of millions of dollars from the government, either the federal government or state governments, or even private businesses. Let me ask you this. Uh, and, and in that period of time, we've had how many study commissions now? Uh, <laughs> two after study after study. Yeah, but let me ask you this. Uh, I hate to say the use of the money. Uh, had seen one dollar from any entity, I'm talking about public entity, to any group of African Americans in the days of talking about relations. First thing, the answer is no. The second no. thing is, I think, here's a what if. Supposed by some magical formula, or we wave the magic wand, and tomorrow, uh, I'll, I'm just going to pull a figure. The government, we, we did a 400 year wrong to you. And we're going to do what we did to the Jap with the Japanese Americans when they put them in and then turn them. We're going to give you dollars. Now, no, the first thing I have to ask is, who are you giving it to? Mm -hmm. The second thing I have to ask is, you're giving it for what? The third thing I have to ask is, how are you giving it? The fourth thing I have to ask is, to all to any organization or what have you what is the process that you're using to monitor to ensure do you have any end game to and money not just going to be run, people going to walmart you know and, and buying everything <laughs> on the top or the, right. or, yeah. or the car dealership that's not, that's not that's not exactly my idea of building a community up but um so the problem is this, Christopher, I still see that is selling an illusion. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a plan, I don't care if you got $10 trillion. If you do not have a plan to number one, how are you going to organize wealth in such a way that it benefits the largest number of people without just mm -hmm. simply individuals profiteering off of that? The second thing I have to add, fundamental the capitalist system and the way the system works does it do that if the answer is no to both of those mm -hmm. I, what's the point i mean because I, I thought it was interesting when you went through oh as a matter of fact you, you went through the rebate reparations and what was the hold on let me you went through rebate reparations hold on because I can go right to it. It was, yeah, because it was, it was, because I think you dealt with the cooperative. Hold on, let me. Yeah, cooperatives. Because, hold on, let me. Let uh, me by the way, uh, Christopher, let me say this. Yeah, Christopher, um, uh, you need to know this because. Okay. Shane. We're talking about nine. Remember now, we're about 1970. Mm -hmm. Back then, uh, that was a buzzword. Then we need to form cooperatives, black cooperatives. Mm -hmm. You almost never hear anybody talking about that today. No, but back then not. that was a big thing because that came out. Wow. Of the, no, that came out of the nationalist movement then. Okay. Um, but today, it's a foreign. It's a foreign concept. It, yeah, I mean, it it, it really is. It, it really is. I mean, there's such. It's, you can really count, you know, the the amount of people even talk about black cooperatives maybe on one hand, you know, and then yeah. like another issue that I saw that you raised was, I guess, the bureaucracy of black cooperatives, because even within yeah. that, they can, I mean, there can still be issues where a black elite can still take advantage of that. And I've even seen the limitations oh, with absolutely. that as well. Yeah, and, and you still got the same problem. Mm -hmm. See, the, it doesn't matter what you call it. Mm -hmm. If you still have a small, small minority at the top that's controlling mm -hmm. everything, just like a, a corporation. You know, you don't have a corporation that Christopher may uh, employ, just for the sake of conversation, mm -hmm. may have people. But a thousand people don't make decisions. A thousand mm -hmm. people are not paid the same. A thousand mm -hmm. people are not profiting the same. A thousand people don't get the same benefits as a, the, a tiny percentage right at the top that essentially control everything, the financing, structure, 
payroll, in all of and most benefits, and the growth where it goes. Now the argument is always made uh, this way. Yeah, but Earl, but wait a minute. Um, aren't they employing people? Isn't that creating wealth? Isn't that something that that's desirable? You know, you're talking about the elite making money, but the fact of the matter is, they are they're making money for a lot of people. They're supporting families. They're able to pay bills, put the kids through school, put food on the table. You know, Christopher, what's interesting about the argument? The same mm -hmm. argument that um, <laughs> uh, the guy from Tesla, uh, the guy from Tesla that owns oh yeah, Elon Musk, Tesla, Elon Musk, the world. Yeah, right, right. Musk, Musk makes that argument. You know, uh, um, um. Bezos makes that argument. Every time mm -hmm. uh, workers come to Amazon and say, wait a minute, you're not paying the living wage. You're exploiting us. <laughs> Bezos says, wait a minute. You know what? I, I, I'm putting food on your table. You know, I'm employing you. I'm giving you a job, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I, yeah. It's the same thing. But what they're not realizing is you're not controlling anything. It's uh -huh. still that tiny elite at the top. That problem. One of the problems. That was actually one of my questions. How does Amazon compare to the major corporations of the 1960s and 70s in terms of monopolizing the market? Oh, uh, no comparison. There's no wow. comparison. Amazon monopolized. Well, remember, well, I think we have to say one other thing, too, that we didn't have to the extent that we have it now in 1970. Globalization. Mm -hmm. Didn't have, remember, you didn't have companies that were routinely going to uh, Thailand, going to Malaysia, the Indonesia, you know, going offshore. You didn't have banks and corporations that were going to these places, producing products in and leaving this country. You know, most manufacturing, remember, Christopher, um, in, in the uh, from before 1980, actually, was still in this country. Wow. Uh, the auto industry, the steel industry, uh, the chemical industry, the industry, most Products were still built and made in America, and you still had a working class in America that had, you know, decent wages, paid mm -hmm. decent benefits. Uh, in many cases, unionized, mm -hmm. uh, had health plans. Let me ask you, how much of that do you have today, with all of these core super corporations now that are, that now have gone global, and essentially they may be doing a few things in Thailand, but not doing a whole heck of a lot for workers in this country, and especially blacks. And people of color. Yeah, I mean, it's really mind boggling because I think one of the things that is a deficit now is the separation between, you know, political organizing and the updated like information that exists now. Because I think, unfortunately, there's a lot of us who are operating off of outdated information. So you used to have people who will try to boycott a global conglomerate, like a, a big corporation which, you know, is totally ineffective. And even how people like approach unions, it's it's just totally different. So I think it's important, even even looking at, um, because I, I think you talked about how in 1960, only 1.1% 1 .1 of 413,000 persons who worked in a particular area were employed. So, and then, Oh, and then I, I think this is in um, I think this is in black businesses, and then I think on the higher side it was two point five percent. So I think we're we're totally unaware of what the actual like statistics are, even for how people are employed. And, and I think it's because you know just most people don't understand how capitalism you know really operates and how many people are actually getting jobs versus you know what we think in in terms of who's getting you know, employ. You know, um, let's fine tune this a little bit more and let's now look okay. at black business today, not 1970. Let's okay. look at it today. Um, and I, but I think, I think we can draw, we can connect the dot between mm -hmm. the past and the present. The fact is when you look at, uh, any urban black community, predominantly black community, and you look at the business structure in that community, uh, now we're not talking about others. Let's just talk about the black business structure to the extent mm -hmm. it exists. Mm -hmm. It's still characters have not changed from 70. Still, there's still the overwhelming majority are one or two person owned businesses. Yep. They are the second thing, they're mom and pop businesses. The third thing, they have a shoe a shoestring budget they're operating on. Mm -hmm. 
Yep. Uh, the fourth thing in most cases, we're talking about the majority. Now, we know there are exceptions. Yeah. But the majority is that owner, that owner does not own that business, does not own the land, does not own the building, does not own anything. He's leasing or she's leasing or renting. Uh, the fifth thing, um, looking at promotions, trying to get clientele in to patronize the business. Um, the fact is, it's always a shoestring struggle. Uh, another thing, mm -hmm. uh, we come to the crucial question. Mm -hmm. how, how many people are employed, blacks? How many people are employed by a black owned, the average black owned business? Christopher, you can count probably on one hand and have some fingers left. I said the <laughs> average, the average, the average uh, they may employ a, a family member, maybe part time. Uh, they're usually working there themselves and maybe, maybe just maybe, maybe one or two other persons part time. That to me is not capitalism. <laughs> that to me is not. No. That, that's not exactly, you know, creating wealth in the community. Um, so again, we have to ask ourselves, what has really changed? Oh, the other thing too, I think we have to realize something that definitely has not changed. And we, we saw this during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh what was the what, what the businesses were the first to go blacks mm -hmm. and the second thing we saw remember with the 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 small amounts of money that were kicked out for pandemic relief what was the mm -hmm. big complaint that black businesses didn't get it <laughs> the guys <laughs> at the top got the money yeah so here we go the same problem yeah i mean it, it's I think a lot of people would have been much more prepared had, you know, more people, you know, been able to read your work and read what was already going on. Because I think, fortunately, a lot of people are operating off delusions and it's it's just so mind boggling to, to, to be so caught up in it, but not realizing what's going on around you. And, but even experiencing what the reality is, it makes you have a lot more empathy and compassion for your people because I think a lot of people are, are so hostile towards our people who are trying to do business. But, you know, a lot of us don't really realize what we're up against because, I mean, you know, just, you know, even the leadership in a lot of these organizations and even even going back to how you talk about the black elite taking over the black church. I thought that was so poignant because not only has that continued on, but that structure continued to exist and I would argue that anybody who's in any type of, you know, religious denomination, I would ask them to prove that their organization doesn't run off this structure because whether it's the black church, whether it's the nation of Islam, whether, I mean, you could, you could pick any or, or the more science temple or, or whoever, there's still a black elite. And then there's a congregation or black masses that are exploited by the leadership and not even just reading your work, but reading several other works. And, and even going back to reading, you know, the Malcolm X final speeches in his last interview, he was getting interviewed with this guy, R.G. Barnett. And I was reading, uh, I was reading another book called Inside the Nation. I mean, it just talked about how a lot of the issues that Malcolm was warning them about got a, a whole lot worse. And I just think it's, it's even important because... I know in your book, you you talked about how, you know, the workers in the nation couldn't, they couldn't negotiate their wages and, you know, just bring everything full circle. It's, it's just mind boggling to see that the one analysis you had of the black church was basically a culmination of all of our organizations. And that's the organizational structure that's being used across the board, not just one organization, but pretty much all of them. Well, okay, let's let's talk about that for a second. Um, mm -hmm. the, the a church is a business; it's still a mm -hmm. business. Uh, you still got you got to pay the light bill, the gas bill, the electric bill. <laughs> you got to you know you got to pay. You got a staff. You got that. Uh, it's still a business, and it's run as a business. Let me tell you the difference, though, between what we saw in 1970 and today. We didn't have then uh, the prosperity preach then that term. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, the process the, with a big mega church, Christopher, if you've been in any of the few black mega churches, see, again, the wealth is still in control, but especially the wealth, profiteering is still held at the top by just a very few 
gathered around the main guy, the, the minister, uh, is held mm -hmm. at the top. They live very, they have businesses, they are entrepreneurs, and they profit. But if you look at the congregation of churches, what do you see? You see poor people. You see working yeah. people. You see struggling people. You see people, in many cases, thought hundreds of people that can't even pay the bill, but they're asked every week to do what? To give, give, give. <laughs> and, you know, they'll say, oh, but you know what? We, here's our reward. Our reward is <laughs> a spiritual satisfaction, redemption. <laughs> well, okay, I, you know what? I, I'm not going to not gonna put that down. I'm yeah. not going to argue with that. I'm not going to minimize that. That's, that's fine. Yeah. Just be advised of one, two things. One, uh, when it's time to pay all the spiritual satisfaction in the world is not going to help. When it comes time to, when the minister asks me to tithe, you cannot just say to him, I don't have any tithing money today. I don't have any uh, collection box money. I don't have anything. <laughs> is it okay if I just pay my rent? Uh, that's not going <laughs> to, yeah. that's not going to fly. <laughs> I think what's so mind boggling, even studying different religious institutions, I didn't realize the amount of pressure the congregation was put under in order to maintain not even just the church, but the leadership and not even maintain, you know, their necessities, but the greed. Like I was under the impression that, you know, even with my, you know, atheist position, I, I understand that like with anything, there are uh, competent pastors who are transparent with how they run things and, you know, utilize our resources but you know the majority man it's it's just it's it's like that neo-colonialism that we talk about that we think is only outside of america but in a lot of cases it's it's the, the most ugliest here well again it's it, to me it's all the same you're creating wealth mm -hmm. at the top but it has nothing to do with the masses who are suffering and but that's the structure we live under you know uh before we leave the church one other thing um I'd be remiss if I didn't say this. Mm -hmm. I must say that in 1969 and 1970, you still had not just Dr. King, but you still had a core of black ministers that were activist ministers in. They actually mm -hmm. were out on the front lines fighting, you know, leading marches, leading rallies, political action, uh, mobilizing their congregation, energizing, you know, folk in the community. And they weren't just thinking about money, money for themselves. You know, they were active. They, we had activist ministers in, black ministers. Mm -hmm. Well, I got to tell you, there's still, there are a few today. But when you're talking about the ones at the top with the big churches, where the money is coming in, that's run as a business. Activism is a dirty word. That's a yeah. dirty word. It doesn't exist. Yeah. I mean, and I guess, you know, a question I have is I notice, you know, mainly with black religious institutions, I know that in order to maintain their tax exempt status, they can't have, you know, a political affiliation. So my question is, are churches or, or black religious institutions across the board, are they incentivized to be apolitical? Because I noticed that not only with the black church, but the Nation of Islam, because I noticed that was a rift between Elijah Muhammad yeah. and Malcolm X becoming political versus being apolitical and, and receiving a lot more support. You got to remember what just the nature of, at least in America anyway, we're not talking about mm -hmm. anywhere else. You know, the, the nature of fundamentalist religions, they're conservative mm -hmm. anyway. So yeah. blacks have always been, as you know, very, the majority have been black fundamentalists in religion, which means yep. very conservative. Conservative yep. in many areas, not always politically, but certainly conservative in terms of values, in terms of family, in terms of quote, moral, unquote. So it's all in business, all of these kinds of things. Uh, it, it encourages conservatism. So that's why, if you noticed, um, when you had Trump, Trump always was surrounded by black ministers. <laughs> he always mm -hmm. had some black preachers around him. Well, but they were conservative. But, yeah. you know, that was nothing unusual about that because that was a mm -hmm. tradition. Um, once again, activism is not encouraged. In fact, it's encouraged. You know, uh, Christopher, you mentioned about the tax uh, exempt status. Can mm -hmm. you imagine if you had churches now, now 
run and a lot of activist stuff, they're going to have to look over their shoulder and say, wait a minute now, mm -hmm. is that going to jeopardize, you know, the money flow from the government? Because that's what the tax exempt status is. Mm -hmm. Not to mention, is it going to jeopardize a lot of our congregation who are very conservative, want to see that? So they got to think it plays into a lot of this. But it doesn't change the fact that it's still at the top and the control. Because I'm glad you brought that up because I think one of our delusions and one of the mythologies is this idea that majority of the religious population are, you know, progressive. It's, it's good that you brought home that point <laughs> that, no. you know, many of them are conservative because, you know, just based on, you know, what you said about Trump or even just the values it's it's just very interesting because I think even when we look at you know liberation theology, even if we accept the tenets and say that this is what's happening, how many churches are operating under communalism or socialism or even cooperative economics? I mean, I, I don't really know of too many. I mean, off the top, I don't, it's I just, don't know any at all. Yeah, I mean, neither do I. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, yeah. I, yeah, I'm stumped. I mean, if if anybody can, you know, provide those churches who are who are, you know, cooperatively run. I mean, even when you think about the structure, I mean, of course, forget sharing resources, sharing power is another thing, you know. But well, you know, uh, first of all, I do. Um, I I the only example I can think of mm -hmm. on personal, again, sure there may be others are mm -hmm. um. In Los Angeles, for a time, we did have one minister, Reverend Reverend Chip Murray, mm -hmm. Cecil Murray. Now, he had a major church, First AME Church in Los Angeles. Now, I'll give him this. He came out of the civil rights tradition. And what he did was he did form an economic development corporation. And what Chip he took money, a lot of money that came in. It was a very well-heeled church. Mm -hmm. And I'll give him this. He established a business incubator for small businesses. He, he built housing, affordable mm -hmm. housing, low mm -hmm. to moderate income housing, um, uh, developed a couple of preschool or a school. Um, so he actually did uh, do exactly what we're talking about. Take some of the funding and wealth from that church structure. Mm -hmm. And he did actually put it into very productive things, housing, education, business. But only one I've seen that. Wow. And by the way, that was 30 years ago. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Wow. I mean, because part of the reason that I bring it up, I don't know if you saw the pastor who a lot of people think he staged a robbery or even even thinking about the comments of, you know, Kim Burrell. But now you have pastors and leaders who are like just downright disrespectful when they're relating, you know, to their congregation and just looking at the just looking at the circumstances is just unbelievable to look at people who you know have little to nothing and demand most of what they have, if not everything. So it's it's just it's mind blowing, it's truly mind blowing. And I guess my question is like not only democratize, you know, our religious institutions, but how do we democratize our organizations? Because I, I noticed one thing that becomes an issue is all of the power being consolidated at the top, but then there's not not only not much power being shared in terms of you know the leadership, but there's also not much you know redistribution and cultivation of the membership as well. So people not only don't get a share of the resources, but they also aren't being developed as well as people. Well, you know what, uh, Christopher, I think that that's probably a good question to maybe wrap things up on. Um, okay. You know, I think we covered a lot of ground. And okay. um, let me take a stab at that, you know, in, in the last few minutes. Um, okay. The short answer is it's not going to happen. And I'll tell you why. This is not 1969. Mm -hmm. you, you know, um, we don't have the organizations we did then. Remember, mm -hmm. back then you had an NAACP, you had an Urban League, you had the Nation of Islam, you had the mm -hmm. Southern Christian Ship Conference, you had a lot of a small core Congress of Racial Equality, you had activist leaders, you had uh, politically oriented organizations, and you had organizations willing to go on the front line. They weren't thinking about just money, dollars, uh, building businesses, 
uh, and enriching themselves. Mm -hmm. You didn't have that 60, almost 50, well, 51 years later. Mm -hmm. uh, you have none of that today. It's almost every, every person for themselves. So it's now individualism. I think the best we can hold for at this point is whether it be a church organization, whether it be someone who's entrepreneurial minded, or whether it's someone who's politically uh, activist minded. I think the best we can hope for is two things. One, that they in the community to the extent that they can, uh, even if it's a small part of the community in terms of how they're doing things with their business, educating others about that, bringing them in, and then politically organizing and activating and mobilizing those that they can uh, around sp particular specific issues. Uh, I think if you can do that, then I think we'll step ahead. Um, mm -hmm. Ending on the, the church, I think it is important with, with churches. There are some out there who do have still a membership in the congregation. I think it's okay. Um, they're not going to risk much by keeping people informed on the issues. If nothing else, Christopher, at least go out and vote. <laughs> at least mm -hmm. pay attention to political issues. And, and certainly exercise your civic responsibility. I don't think that's too much to add in this climate. So I think mm -hmm. if we can do that, I think we'll be that much further along. Uh, you know, Christopher, one thing I wanted to do before you know we wrap it up. Okay. Do you have the do you have the myth of black capitalism in there? Oh yes. Can you bring yeah. it up again? Yes. That's what I want to do. I'd like cause I'd like to take a shot if I could. Oh yeah, go ahead. With me. Okay, yeah, take your time. Okay. Okay, got it. <laughs> oh, here we go. Yep, yep. You know, we've gone, we've gone almost an hour now. Okay, yeah. So, uh, did did you get most, did you get most of it in? Because um, you know what, you know what, Christopher, let me, let me make a suggestion. We can always okay. come back and do a part. We can always come back and do a part two at okay, another yeah, time. Mo yeah, yeah, most definitely. I would love to do that. And, you know, you can definitely let me know when you're free again. And we could definitely do this again because, yeah, we can, you know, just pick up. We can pick up where we left off at because, I mean, man, I, I, I really went through it and I, I, I got a whole bunch of questions. But, yeah, you I mean, but you covered a, a whole lot of ground as well, though. Like, I'm I'm, I'm, well, I'm glad I'm, I'm just glad that you were you, you still it seemed like you. You still almost like memorized it, you know. So I was thoroughly impressed. <laughs> <laughs> thoroughly impressed. Well, that's why I say let's go back, you know, let's put a little space in between. We got um we got the midterms coming up in November. Let okay. me make a suggestion. Okay. Maybe in October, come back and we tie it back in you know, not only political structure. But... Mm -hmm. So anyway, think about that. Okay, yeah, most definitely, most definitely. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is uh, Author Spotlight with uh, Dr. Earl O'Far Hutchinson. And this was part one of the myth of black capitalism. Thank you, Dr. Hutchinson. Um, and uh, thank you for um, all supporting, you know, the Omni African Collective. It's, it's great to be back. And then uh, thanks again. And we're we continuing to build community pending revolution. Omni African Collective. Building community, pending revolution.